Now let's talk about tissues. There are three sections that we'll go through, epithelial tissue, connective tissue, and then we'll finish up with both muscle and nervous tissue. For epithelial tissue, these are the learning outcomes. There are four main tissue types. We have epithelial, connective, nervous, and muscular tissue. Every cell or tissue in our body belongs to one of these four groups. You will be asked about these four groups. We will then go into detail of each of these groups, but you should still know the big picture, what type of tissue or what cell is in which of these four categories. There are functions of epithelial tissue that have to do with it covering or lining. So epithelial covers, like on the surface of the skin, or lining, meaning it's lining kidney tubules, or lining the stomach, or lining the air sacs of our lungs. It makes glands. So epithelial tissue, if you always think of it as covering or lining a cavity or tube. Characteristics of epithelial tissue are that they are close together. There are no gaps between them. They sit on a basement membrane. So the cells are side by side. They sit on a flat, on a surface, doesn't have to be flat. And they have one surface that's exposed or free. That would be facing the outside world since it's on the skin surface or facing the air if it's in the lungs or facing the middle of the stomach where food would be. So it has one free surface. Um, they, it's also known as being avascular. It means it doesn't have blood vessels. So blood vessels comes only to the basement membrane where it's anchored to. That's where it gets its nutrients. And they also regenerate well because they're always being damaged on the surface of your skin. It's exposed to a lot of harsh environments. So you're constantly growing new epithelial tissue on the surface of your skin, which is why also cancers of epithelial tissue can grow rapidly. How epithelial tissue is named are really like a first name and a second name. The first name is all about the layering. So it could be one layer and it's known as simple. It could be more than one layer and its first name would be stratified. And then there's one category that looks like it's more than one layer, but it actually is one layer. So it's pseudo stratified. So one of these three is going to be the first name. The second name is about its shape. It's squamous means it's flat like a tile, a piece of um, t flat tile for your kitchen. Cuboidal would be like a square building block and rectangular would be more like a brick. We can see the categorization here, whether you have simple, which is one layer, or stratified, which is more than one layer, or from the left, we can see it's squamous. Is it one layer of these flat cells or is it a stacked up layer? Cuboidal cells, is it one layer or more than one layer? So we can see how they're named that way. Simple or one layer is ideal for passive diffusion, meaning in alveoli, we let air, oxygen across or carbon dioxide or absorption in our gut, we let nutrients in. So this is where we're absorbing it. Stratified means we want a little more protection. So we have more cell layers. Uh, we also see this in glands as well. Pseudostratified is only going to be in the lining of the airway. It has such a great turnover that you have small baby cells and taller, more mature cells, but they're always growing. So they are at different levels of development. So it has a stacked or stratified look, but indeed they're only one cell layer thick. The shapes again are squamous, cuboidal, or columnar. They're named in the example here in green, it's one layer of the flat one, so it's known as simple squamous epithelial tissue. Or in blue, stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Or in the lower left, in black, it's one layer and it's the brick-shaped one. So it's known as simple columnar epithelial tissue. And we can see on the lower right, stratified cuboidal epithelial tissue. 
So the simple epithelial tissue, this is what they look like and you should be comfortable seeing them. You'll see them in lab activities or uh, some other activities where you're gonna have to identify simple squamous, they're flat and thin, or the cuboidals. We can see this one in the circular arrangement with um, in the kidney tubule or simple columnar and then the pseudostratified columnar ciliated. Stratified, we're only gonna see two different examples. Stratified squamous means it's a stack of little flat ones, kind of like a stack of pancakes. And then transitional, in this case, they look like stratified cuboidal. So in order to not confuse you with it, I'm just gonna tell you, we're not gonna see a stratified cuboidal. I'm only gonna show you transitional. Transitional, in this case, is in the bladder. And so this is an empty bladder where it's smaller, and so the inside's more stacked up. But if the bladder fills and expands, these transitional can actually move and they slide along each other so it can be only a few layers thick. So it um, is only found in the bladder. Stratified squamous, when we talk about the skin change, we'll see it will be keratinized. That's on the right. That's characteristic of on the surface of our skin. But we also have stratified squamous epithelium, say inside of our mouth or down our esophagus, and it's known as non-keratinized. So you can see that where it's more like the stacked pancakes without that distinctive line in the middle um, that's characteristic of the epidermis. So these are some of the functions of epithelial tissue. So you should be aware of this. If we talk about the epithelial tissue in the intestines, it is its job is for absorption. But we also have on our surface of our skin, because it's stratified, protection. Um, glands, it's a part of always going to be part of glands, so secretion is an important part of epithelial tissue function. The gland component, we have either exocrine glands or endocrine glands. I just put these in capital letters, the exo and endo, just to emphasize that, but that's not really how it's spelled. It has it, it doesn't have to have the all caps at the beginning. But exocrine gland, I always like to think of EXO as an exit, meaning it has ducts that it's sending it out like sweat glands out into the onto the surface of your head or acid being produced and being dropped off into the lumen of the stomach. Endocrine glands I mean they're staying inside. That's more like our thyroid gland or our adrenal gland or our pancreas, where it's actually secreting it into the blood. The endocrine gland secretes their chemicals into the blood as hormones, and we have a whole chapter dedicated on that. So let's focus on the exocrine glands. They are either one of these three types, pseudoriferous, has two types. So the pseudoriferous, we have marocrine, also known as ecrine, that's known in the blue, and it just is a cell that makes sweat or, you know, just that comes out of the cell and the cell remains intact. The apocrine of the pseudoriferous glands, it's in red. Notice that pieces of cell are actually being released. So this has a few more protein elements and these are found in your armpits and genitals and they actually are what provide um, food for bacteria that causes body odor. Also, if um, in animals, it includes things like pheromones and is involved in sexual reproduction. So these are known as the apocrine glands. Sebaceous glands, which we can see in the yellow droplets, notice that the cell walls are broken. It shows it in dashed lines because a sebaceous gland, it builds and fills itself with a lot of oil, but the whole gland blows up. It destroys itself to release the oil. So it's the whole cell ruptures and there's a lot of cellular debris. So sebaceous glands are your oil glands that are at the base of each of our hair follicles on the surface of our skin and obviously in our hair. We can see this other diagram showing how the merocrine, this first one, which is more, I like to think of it as watery sweat, or the apocrine, that's the second pseudoriferous kind. That's where little chunks of cells are released with the product. So there's more protein in there, which gives is provides food for some of the bacteria. So this, I like to think in a casual way as stinky sweat. 
Um, and the holocrine type of secretion, the bottom here, is what our sebaceous glands, it's the method or mode of the secretion. So our sebaceous glands means this whole cell is going to rupture just to let the oil out. Another part of epithelial tissue is our hair and our fingernails. So hair is actually made by epithelial tissue we have parts of the hair, the follicle and erector pili muscle. That's what makes your hair stand on end when you're scared or you're cold. The pore where the hair comes out. We also have the fingernails. It has a matrix, which is a growth area. We have the epichondrium, which is the cuticle, the body and the lunula. You should know the four main tissue types, epithelial, connective, muscular, and nervous. You should also know the features and functions of epithelial tissue. The classification, layers, simple, stratified, as well as the shape, squamous, cuoidal, columnar, and their functions. You should know the location of, the, of each one of the types of epithelial tissue and its role. So simple squamous epithelial tissue can be found in the alveoli of the lungs. It's nice and flat. So its function is to allow for diffusion. Simple cuboidal epithelial tissue would be in, say, the kidney tubules. And anything that's a cuboidal one is going to be all about pumping something. So it's usually involved in glands or pumping waste or debris. And simple columnar epithelial tissue is going to be what's lining our intestines so we can absorb nutrients, but it's columnar, so it's a big one, so it also actually has some protective roles. And then we should know that pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue along the trachea is constantly growing, so that's why you have different sizes of cells. You should know about endocrine glands. Endocrine secretes its substance into the blood. So that's known with the hormones. The exocrine gland is actually secreting it out into a space. And the space could be the world. So it could be sweat on the surface of your skin. Or the space could be your mouth, like saliva. Um, or in your stomach, like acid. So those would be exocrine glands. And you should know the three modes of secretion. So you should know the merocrine or eccrine, you should know the apocrine, and you should know the holocrine, that each one, and the holocrine is the same as the sebaceous, it's just how it's produced. Connective tissue. Connective tissue is made of these three main things. You have your cells, you're gonna have some cells that make bone. So they're gonna known as osteocytes. Anything with the ending site means cell. A chondrocyte means cartilage. A fibroblast, well a fibrocyte technically, um, is going to make some sort of fiber. And then we have blood cells. So connective tissue is made of cells. There's also going to be fibers in connective tissue. So we have collagen, elastin, reticular fibers. Those are all different fiber types that we have available to make different types of connective tissue. So we have cells and fibers, and then they have to be within some sort of gel or some sort of medium. So if we have, say, bone is one of our connective tissues, we have bone cells, we actually have a lot of collagen fibers in our bone, and it's in the hard cement that we're familiar with that is bone. So that would be the ground substance in bone. Um, something like our dermis of our skin, we're gonna have cells, we're gonna have strong collagen fibers, and we have our ground substance in our skin is gonna be a little bit more movable than it is in bone. And to the extreme, blood is actually part of our connective tissue. We have cells in the blood. The blood can make fibers, and the ground substance in blood is actually pretty watery. That's the plasma. So it's just the medium that the cells and the fibers exist in. So that's what defines connective tissue. These are the different types of connective tissue, so there's quite a lot. There's dense, loose, cartilage, bone, and blood. But in the dense category, we have three different types. In the loose, also three different types, and the cartilage. Dense connective tissue are three different categories. We can see dense, regular connective tissue, 
the collagen fibers are actually aligned in a row. So we can see it as this nice striped pattern because they're stacked together like a whole bunch of pencils. This forms our tendons and ligaments and it's our strongest connective tissue because they're all lined up nice and orderly like you'd line up a whole bunch of ropes and pulling and that would make for maximal pulling force. They're also layered throughout our muscles. Dense irregular connective tissue, the irregular nature means the collagen fibers are crisscrossing, they're in different directions. This is what makes the dermis of our skin and it makes our skin really, really strong. We have a lot of collagen, but it goes in different directions because we need to be strong in a lot of different directions, not just a tendon, which would be point A to point B. Then there's dense elastic connective tissue, and it has a lot of alignment of the elastin, and we'll find these in the vocal cords. For the exams, you should probably just focus on dense regular connective tissue as being the strongest and what it looks like, as well as dense irregular connective tissue and what it looks like and that it's made or it makes up skin. Loose connective tissue, we have adipose connective tissue. It really is just fat. So fat is used for protection. When we layer it on areas, it's gonna have a high amount of weight pushed on it, say our bottom, so we can withstand sitting for a long time. Or energy storage, this is obviously where we're having a lot of energy. So if we need some ATP, we will mobilize some of this fat. We can, it's a characteristic because it looks like these big white circles with the nucleus off to the side because it's just filled with fat. Then we have areolar connective tissue. It's sort of known as this sort of superficial fascia and it surrounds organs, kind of helps, it's like packing material, holds organs in place. It tears quite easily. If you have, say, a chicken and you're peeling um, raw chicken and you're peeling the skin off of it, you will see this areal or connective tissue is this real stringy stuff, but it tears quite easily. Then there's reticular connective tissue. This is only found in the spleen and it holds cells. So it actually is more like this web and the cells are sitting on them and it's our immune cells looking for bad guys. So it actually is in our spleen where our blood is filtering. So it's involved in filtration and lets our cells inspect our blood. So reticular connective tissue is just this really light stringy stuff meant to hold our own immune system cells so we can look for bad guys. Cartilage. Hyaline cartilage is our most common cartilage in our body. It is at the ends of all of our bones. So if somebody has arthritis, it's a hyaline cartilage problem. It also forms part of our nose. It forms the rings of our trachea that you can feel when you run your finger down your neck. Then there's fibrocartilage. It's cartilage, but it has strong collagen fibers in it. And we find these in our intervertebral discs as well as the menisci of our knee. It's meant to withstand a lot of weight and stress. So it needs the extra collagen to make it a little bit tougher. There's elastic cartilage, it has elastin fibers, so it kind of looks like fibrocartilage, and you see it in things that need a lot more flexibility, like the ends of our nose, as well as our ears. Other connective tissue types, as I mentioned earlier, bone and blood are also in the connective tissue. So we're gonna talk about these in their own separate chapters, but I still, you do need to know that blood and bone are in the connective tissue family. This is a picture of a cadaver leg. So it's a thigh, we can see the muscle, and then we can see actually several types of connective tissue here. So what do we see first? This flat tendon portion, that's known as dense regular connective tissue. And then we have this real stringy stuff. If we're pulling this away from the muscle, that's gonna be loose areolar connective tissue. And then that yellow stuff there, that's just a bunch of fat. So that's loose adipose connective tissue. For connective tissue, you should know what are the components, the cells, the fibers, and the ground substance you should know the cells that form the matrix. You're gonna have osteocytes, meaning bone cells, or chondrocytes, or fibroblasts in this case I mentioned. Function and location of the different connective tissue types. And fascia locations and types of connective tissue that make up each layer, like we just saw on that cadaver leg. 
For muscle and nervous tissue, these will also be addressed in their own independent chapters, but we'll just cover them briefly here. There are three types of muscle tissue. The first one, skeletal muscle tissue. It's what we just see on our, on our bodies. That's what we're using to walk with, to lift things. So it's voluntary, it's attached to our bone via tendons, and it's responsible for our movement. Cardiac muscle, only found in the heart. Smooth muscle is actually throughout our whole body. We don't even realize it's there because it works without us thinking about it. It's what churns our stomach when we're trying to digest food. It's what changes when we want to increase or decrease our blood pressure. It's what moves our in our esophagus to bring food down while we're swallowing. It is involved in a lot of our autonomic or things that we don't have to think about processes in our body. This is what they look like. There is skeletal muscle that has these long cylindrical cells and fibers, multinucleated, I mean it has more than one nucleus. Because these cells are so long, for instance, your bicep from up near your shoulder all the way down towards your elbow, that's one cell is going to expand that whole distance. So a skeletal muscle cell is as long as the whole muscle itself. So it has to have lots of nuclei across that whole distance so that the cell can maintain repair and lifelong health. It has striations, so we can see side to side these tiny little dark and light stripes. Those are known as striations, and it's voluntary. So you have to have a conscious thought in your brain to tell it to move. Cardiac muscle, on the other hand, is involuntary, meaning it's just working without your brain needing to tell it to be each time. It has short branch cells. It conducts electricity. That's how the cells in our heart get beat to beat, get the signal. And it also is striated. We can see tiny striations up and down in this picture, the light and dark. And then to the right is smooth muscle. These are elongated cells. They look a lot like the dense regular connective tissue, um, but you can see the cells a little more prominently. They're usually pink. These are the ones that's around organs and vessels. Nervous tissue, on the other hand, can transmit electrical impulses. It responds to stimuli. It's so it's electrically active, and it's found in the brain, spinal cord, and peripheral nerves. So a single neuron has these body parts. We don't need to know them, the details at this time. We will talk about the nervous tissue specifically in another chapter known as neurophysiology. But I did want you to have them listed here for, so your notes would be complete. So a neuron's job is to conduct electrical impulses and you should know its location and you should know what it looks like. So you should know the types and examples of muscle tissue the three types. You should be able to identify them if you were to see a histology slide of them. You should know the features and functions, whether it has many nuclei or only one nuclei, whether it's voluntary or involuntary, and whether it's striated or not. And then you should know what nervous tissue is and where it can be found.